I'm not gonna use this phrase lightly, I'm gonna mean it. I truly sincerely believe that this is probably the worst food for the human gut. And I'm not talking about the gut microbiome, it's bad for that too, I'm talking about the actual damage to the gut that this compound, this product can cause. I'm gonna cut right to the chase. I need you to hear me out on the science here because I really don't understand why this is still in food. And this is in some ways a call to arms. We need to change this. This should not be in our food. This is something that is not good. We see it in the evidence. It's hard to really look at it in a, a living human so I can understand why it can still be generally recognized as safe but it's polysorbate 80, polysorbate 60, and to a certain degree, carrageenan, but there's some nuance there. I'm gonna talk about specific foods that contain these, but you could do a simple Google search. But either way, when we get towards the end, I'll talk about specific foods. I wanna talk about the actual science here. Please drop a comment down below for the algorithm. If you're with me on this and you really feel the pain too, like you understand what I'm talking about, just drop a comment down below. It also helps the video. It gets that engagement up. So let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So it's a synthetic emulsifier, okay? Now I understand why it's there. It's usually there to increase shelf life and like polysorbate 60 is gonna be in like coffee creamers, a lot of times in baked goods, whereas polysorbate 80 is gonna be a little bit more in like ice cream and sauces. It's designed to really mix fat and water and ultimately make it more consistent and smooth. It makes sense why it would be there. So you might see it as E433 or E435. Thing is, is how it's made, when you first look at it, you're like, this isn't that bad. It's made from sorbitol and some fatty acids, two kind of natural components, right? So when they mix these together with a chemical, it becomes a surfactant. So it essentially becomes something that can mix oil and water. So let's talk about what it does first with the mucosal layer. We have a few different things we gotta look at. Mucosal layer and the actual intestine itself. The mucosal layer is like our very first line of defense. So with this, there was a study published in Scientific Reports. This was one of the early studies when they were first like in 2018, wondering if this was questionable. So first of all, this was looking specifically at the mucosal layer, but what's really interesting about this, we just started finding out in like 2018 that this could be problematic. We know how slow things go. We're seeing it with the red dye situation right now. We're just now getting to a point after like a decade of really flagging this stuff where it's becoming known and we're still having to wait another five or so years for these things to actually get banned. So this is a long bureaucratic process. So this just came on the radar in 2018. So we can't come here and say, oh, come on, it's been in food for a long time, it's safe. No, we just started understanding the problem in 2018. So this first study was actually to investigate the initial problem. They looked at acute exposure, like immediately what happens with carboxymethylcellulose, and in this case, polysorbate 80 on intestinal cells. So this initial study was in vitro, but trust me, we have more data than just this. They found that it significantly thinned the mucosal layer, and they found that it was able to increase the rate of speed in which E. coli passed through the intestinal layer and into the bloodstream. Okay, that's just a clear example of degrading the gut barrier to the point where you could actually have a pathogen pass through easier. That doesn't sound good to me. Now this study was early on, but the authors still made a pretty solid note, and I quote, acute exposure to emulsifiers impacts barrier and structural properties of intestinal mucus, which may contribute to the development of intestinal inflammation. Why is this potentially occurring? Well, what they found with this was that there was a genetic change that occurred. So emulsifiers like polysorbate 80 and 60 actually altered the gene expression of what is called mucin. In this case, it's mucin-2. Mucin-2 is a gene that produces mucus or triggers the production of mucus. It altered the expression. It changed how this gene was actually created in the body. Okay, well that's in vitro, so we can't take that all the way to the bank. First off, let me say, there's a lot of stuff that's hard to study in the human body. Okay, we can't ethically always just test gut permeability in a human. Almost always you look at gut permeability initially in rodents. And how much data do we need to say, hey, this stuff is not good. When I had Dr. Jacob Torres on my channel, he's literally telling me like, yeah, we use polysorbate 80 to like in induce inflammation. We use polysorbate 80 to induce a leaky gut. It's literally used for that, guys. Why would we use like, something we use in a lab to induce inflammation in our food? And I understand but there's other things we can use, and we'll get to that because there's actually a study that outlined this coming up in just a moment. So let's talk tight junction proteins and gut permeability. Tight junction proteins are proteins that make our gut barrier strong. Zonulin, occludin, cloudin, these are really important proteins that trigger the gut to be solid and strong, okay? We don't want these things to weaken. That's a big problem when it comes to inflammation. 
So this study was published in Allergy, and they were taking a look at intestinal cells, again with polysorbate AD and emulsifiers, and they were using a type of electrical signaling. So in this case, it's called trans-epithelial electrical resistance. They were able to use electricity to see like what can permeate through the gut after exposure to polysorbates. Number one, they found lysis across every single model they tested, meaning cellular death, meaning breaking down, destroying cells. They found lysis across all models, meaning literally destroying cells across every model they tested. 0.1% concentration of polysorbate caused lysis across all cells. Now the downstream effect of this, increased permeability, gut permeability, and decreased expression of the tight junction proteins that cause the gut to be strong in the first place. How much more do we need with this stuff? Now, before I get into the microbiome stuff, because I know people kind of glaze over with the microbiome, I'm gonna keep it pretty straightforward and simple. And I'm gonna tell you the gospel truth here. I don't think there's a supplement you could take that could combat this. The best thing you could do is just avoid this stuff. And yes, if you wanna point your finger at me and say I'm fear-mongering, you can call it that. I call it, this stuff shouldn't be in our food. I'm doing a service by saying, Maybe we shouldn't freak out, but maybe we should look at the ingredients because there are plenty of foods that don't have this stuff. And if we vote with our dollars and we maybe make some noise on this, maybe this stuff won't be there anymore because you'll be shocked at some of the foods that it's in. Now, for the record, if you do want to be able to protect your gut the best that you possibly can, I do think things like bone broth, I think things like collagen are hugely effective. I do think a good probiotic is helpful when it comes down to the microbiome. There's clear evidence there. I put a link down below for the one that I use. It's called Seed. That's the one I've been using for about four or five years now. That one is very unique with a capsule inside of a capsule technology. So it actually survives the hydrochloric acid in your gut and gets into the intestinal tract. So it has this capsule that breaks down first and then another capsule. So when it comes down to probiotics, it's literally the only one I'd recommend. It's a 25% off discount link as well. So if you want to try that one out, it's called Seed, literally the only probiotic I recommend. So now I want to get into this microbiome research. I'm just going to read you a quote from the author from this study that was published in Microbiome in 2021. In accordance with previous studies, both carboxymethylcellulose and polysorbates induce a lasting, seemingly detrimental impact on microbiota composition. Seriously detrimental effect. And lasting, meaning we don't know how long this effect could last in the body. The interesting thing is, is they tested all kinds of emulsifiers and they found that the polysorbates, but also the carrageenans were problematic for the microbiome. And I've done videos even sort of trying to defend carrageenan in the past, being like, okay, there's different forms of like polygenin and carrageenan, and yes, that is true. But at the end of the day, concentrated amounts of these emulsifiers are probably not the best thing. Maybe small amounts of something like carrageenan from red seaweed, but polysorbate is chemically adulterated. That is a pure like Franken food, Franken compound, right? The good news is lecithin actually didn't cause damage to the microbiome. So there's a lot of things out there that use sunflower lecithin or even soy lecithin. It's not having much of the actual primary parent ingredient. It's just the lecithin. So if you see lecithin on an ingredient list, I wouldn't freak out. Not all that bad. But then there was a study published in SOJ, Microbiology and Infectious Disease. And this looked once again at polysorbate and how it impacted lipopolysaccharides, LPS. LPS are toxic molecules that are produced from gram-negative bacteria in our gut. They are toxic molecules that in their own existence are problematic and cause intestinal inflammation. Okay, so by itself, polysorbate increases the production, more LPS, more lipopolysaccharides, this inflammatory molecule. Then you couple that with the fact that the polysorbate is degrading the mucosal layer and degrading gut barrier integrity while also producing more LPS. That means more lipopolysaccharides get through and lipopolysaccharides are once again in a laboratory setting how we induce inflammation. So you are allow, you're creating more of an inflammatory molecule all the while increasing and opening the door so this inflammatory molecule can get into the bloodstream. And here we are focused on our macronutrients all the time is a problem. And we look at these things and we forget that, hey, it all starts in the gut, right? Like, isn't there like ancient ownages to this about health being in the gut and disease starting in the gut? I think we should be paying closer attention to the wisdom of our elders, ancient elders. Let me list off a few foods that I know have polysorbates. Kraft salad dressings, okay? This is used to simply mix the oil and the water, right? Hidden Valley Ranch, 
also has it, used to mix the oil and the water so you have a stable salad dressing. You won't always see it. Sometimes if you have to shake the salad dressing, that's usually a better sign. A lot of processed cakes, like Little Debbie's, like the little cupcakes, Hostess Twinkies, Hostess, uh, like the Swiss rolls, things like, hopefully you're not eating these things, but it's funny because polysorbate is actually used to just increase the dough elasticity there. Just making it so it's a, a chewier, it's a novelty thing. You don't absolutely need it. Doritos, the nacho cheese flavor specifically, I could find. The Lay's barbecue ones. And you know what they do? They do it for this to be able to even the flavor. So when you eat a chip, you don't accidentally get a little bit too much barbecue and not enough on the other side of the chip. Because these food scientists study how this food hits your palate and they know what's gonna make you eat more. And a little bit of polysorbate, never mind the fact that it could be destroying your gut, is gonna make it so that you eat a couple more chips and they make a couple more bucks. We can stop this stuff, this needs to stop. Then ice creams. Okay, now again, you have to dig, right? Even if you Google search, like which ice creams have polysorbate, you're not gonna find all the answers, you have to look yourself, but it's easy, just look at the label, right? But like Mayfield, a lot of these different ones, Kroger, Publix, these, these off brands, they have in it. You can also find it in many dryers ice creams. You have to be careful. Now here's the kicker. And I'm really digging hard on more research here, so hope to have another video on this soon. But it looks as though a lot of chewing gums have it. So fortunately, the ones that I'm finding are the ones that have sugar in them already. So like double mint and things like that, where they, hopefully you're not chewing those gums anyway, because why would you just chew on sugar gum these days? Like, it's just, I don't know. But at that point, you're getting an emulsifier just in a concentrated form that you're just chewing on. So that could be problematic. And I'm not, again, if chewing gum helps you eat less, like what's the net positive or net negative there? Well, the goal is maybe find a gum that doesn't have that stuff in it. I like to chew gum too. And when I found this out, I'm like, okay, now I definitely look at my gums, right? So yeah, I'm not opposed to gum, but we have to be aware of what's in it. Like, is it really worth it? And this might be small scale stuff that you don't think about, but again, our health and our disease really does start in our gut. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.